hello everyone uh, welcome to this session of the infosys procurement confluence where uh, as you all know we interact with uh, procurement leaders um, uh, procurement and supply chain leaders across the globe to share um, insights experiences and best practices in their uh, sustainability journey and uh, today we have um, jim govan senior vice president global supply chain and chief sustainability officer for Verizon with us to share some insights and experience on his sustainable uh, the sustainability journey at Verizon. To tell you a little more about Jim, um, since taking on these complementary roles in 2009, Jim's team has enlisted more than 58,000 Verizon employees in um, more than 53 countries around the globe to uh, help in reducing the company's environmental footprint while increasing the efficiency of a grow growing enterprise. Jim has been um, deeply involved in the advancement of innovative and sustainable technologies and spearheaded the launch of Verizon's uh, first ever green bond in early 2019. Not only that, uh, Jim oversees other green initiatives throughout the company, including setting up Verizon's uh, first uh, science-based emission reduction targets, expanding recycling and waste reduction, uh, and the management of uh, end-of-life uh, uh, material recovery. In his supply chain role, Jim also leads um, all the sourcing, inventory planning, and logistics operations globally. And uh, in that, Jim is responsible for planning over $35 billion of inventory across all of Verizon's lines of businesses. Now that's a, a huge scope to cater to Jim. And uh, not only that, um, he's a member of um, Penn State University's Smeal Sustainability Advisory Board, the current chairman of the Global Enabling Sustainability Initiative, and a board member of the MIT Climate and Sustainability Consortium. Now that's a very impressive um, I would say a set of credentials um, that I have seen in a long time. So congratulations, Jim, for um, such an impressive profile that you have. And, um, and all the more reason why we will look forward to uh, your insights, experiences in managing this vast portfolio and uh, implementing and bringing to life all the initiatives that you've been leading. So welcome to the show once again, Jim. Thanks, Chris. I really appreciate you uh, sending over the invitation, and uh, thank you for the kind words. But uh, it's it's really I'm just a guy lucky enough to be here. It's it's all about Verizon and and the unbelievable things uh, the company has done uh, over the years. At least in, during my time here, I'm I'm super proud of the company and and all the great things that we've accomplished. Uh, I really like um, your humility as well, uh, and so with that. Um, uh, you mentioned about taking on these roles since 2009. So um, how has the journey, how did it uh, kick off? What were some, say, defining moments? Um, what was the sponsorship that was available? Did it start off as some small initiative and become big or it was already big? Could you share some insights and um, uh, your experiences through this journey? Yeah, absolutely. So. Um... You know, I've been at Verizon now 27 years, so I, I pretty much believe black and red. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I feel like I owe everything to this company, and I'm, and I'm very, very, we call ourselves uh, V-teamers. I'm a proud V-teamer. Um, but when when you look at what happened in 2009, uh, our chairman at the time uh, <clears throat> made mention to uh, me and brought me in and said we were going to start this uh, sustainability thing. I said, that's fantastic. At the time, I was running our fleet of over 45,000 vehicles. I had our wireline supply chain around the world, uh, and I was also managing the transformation and strategy of our supply chain organization. You know, in, in very quick response, I said, I, I'd be honored to take on the role. I really wasn't even too sure what it meant, and uh, asked him the question of, um, well, who's going to do my job? He said, that's the best part. You're going to do that too. Uh, and I said, ah, I get it. I get it. And very quickly, um, I had one go-to person I called, uh, and she was down in Texas, and she was employee number two in sustainability. And about 30 days after the two of us got together, we realized, you know, we paid the fuel bill 
for the company. We paid the electric bill. Uh, we were responsible for more cardboard than we ever knew we were responsible for. We were putting things on planes when we should have put them on boats. We were putting things on trucks when we could have put them on trains. All these things that are just in the, in the makeup of a supply chain day-to-day -day world, and it became incredibly apparent why um, sustainability fit right here in an operations group of people operating around the world looking at end-to-end -end supply chain. And immediately, I had over 2,000 of our team members here in global supply chain focused on sustainability, thinking about every decision they make as it relates to uh, being a responsible supplier, being a responsible customer, being a responsible end-to-end, -end, what we refer to as a sustainable supply chain uh, representative. So that's where it all started in 2009. It kind of led us on our journey. And uh, fast forward to where we are now, and we'll talk about it here in a few minutes, but uh, it's been an amazing ride. And, and again, I am just super proud of all the things we've accomplished and what we're about to accomplish because the journey is far from over. So that's uh, a very incredible journey. And uh, so uh, while you were uh, doing this, uh, did you feel that uh, the existing set of, say, competencies and skills were enough, or did you have to bring in additional people who were, uh, say, more experienced or oriented on the sustainability front, or um, there was some training for the existing team. So just as a learning for other people that um, are these uh, uh, initiatives, can they be done with the existing set of people, or you just need a completely different set of uh, new team uh, to be able to do anything on this front? Uh, it's an excellent question because um, I firmly believe this. And again, growing up in, in a, a really large company, seeing all the different opportunities of Horizon, we do have the best V-team workforce there is. And I, and, and I mean that. I'm very proud of everyone here. And you start thinking about how technology has changed and the evolution of technology, the speed of technology, the way we did things when I started and the way we do things now is completely different. And then you go and you look at uh, something like sustainability, which is really... Um, when you think about the product life cycle curve, it's really still down in its immature state. A lot of great ideas, a lot of great things being done, renewable energy, IoT devices, all those great things that are going to change our world long term. But we have a long way to go. So then you start thinking about how do you go after this massive opportunity, whether it's scope one in your fuel, scope two in your electricity, or scope three in your entire value chain. Your question, and I want to come back to it, is, is just so important because you start thinking about, oh, I must get all new people. I must go outside and get experts. And we actually just went the opposite. Um, we looked at the folks we had. A, we identified people who had passion about sustainability in their personal lives, which, by the way, that's a home run because they don't even realize that they're, they're working as much as they are because they're just passionate about what they do every single day. But then part two, no one can make the changes or recognize the opportunities. So then it became, okay, how big do we want to grow the sustainability team? And that's a real, real differentiator in my mind. We kept it small. We've kept it under 10 people since 2009, and we're never going to grow it above that. I believe we're at eight right now. And, and why is that? Because the moment I make it 30, 40, 50 people, all of a sudden becomes sustainability team's responsibility or Jim Gowan's responsibility. And that's not what sustainability is about. It is an absolute team sport, and it has to be across the entire corporation. It has to be in every business unit. And it's about changing the culture, changing the mindset of what you do day in, day out, and how you think about negotiations if you're in sourcing, how you think about logistics if you're, if you're trying to transport things, import or export. If you're in new product development, how you think about the energy consumption of a device or a 5G radio. It's all those different pieces that go into all the different aspects of what makes up a very large corporation. That's, that's the transformation journey. That's the culture that you need to change. And that's what we've been on since 2009. So I wish I could tell you they went out and hired an expert in sustainability. I'm not that guy. But we've chosen, just like we do with everything else at Verizon, we identify an opportunity, we run to it, we, we um, start small, we grow our opportunities, and we do it through incremental steps to make sure we got the end goal in mind, but we're working towards it every day. And again, I go back to that word of culture, and it turns into the culture of how you operate your business, whether it's large or small, 
And if anyone's listening to this who's on the beginning of their journey, that's where I automatically start. Take mm-hmm. out the passion of your employees and put it play. Uh, I think that's um, uh, an important lesson for uh, everyone else. And typically, whenever there is something new like this, people look for external help as well. So I think it's very interesting to know that um, you've been able to do that uh, by um, leveraging the internal strengths rather than looking for um, you know, external help, which I think is a, is a very interesting way of going about this. Now, typically we see, Jim, that in these kind of journeys, uh, there are always some conflicts, right? So there is budget pressure because everybody wants to do it at the the lowest cost uh, available because finance has only that much money to give to people or they would want to give to people. So, uh, and typically the, uh, even if that's not the reality, in some cases it is, but in several cases it may not be, that sustainability is more expensive than the the usual way of uh, going about things. So have you seen any of those situations and uh, uh, how did those, uh, at a larger level, you know, we keep hearing that these CFOs and all are on board, but at the operating level, it's not so because everybody has their own metrics and numbers to meet and their immediate targets and uh, POs to cut and so on and material to ship and so on. So at an operating level, how did those, uh, did those conflicts happen and how were you able to drive some of those changes? Yeah, no, it's, it's great. As you were talking there, I was going to interrupt you and say, do you know our CFO? Um, but the role of the CFO is to make sure you're challenging the expenses of the company uh, in, in a very strong way all the time. And you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, the business case for sustainability is incredibly, incredibly important. And it's looking at uh, sustainability from a TCO perspective, a total cost of ownership. It goes right back to a supply chain and sourcing and really business case 101. Um, how do you look at uh, the impacts of any new product, any new technology. Uh, when we went through uh, through my time here from a copper to fiber migration, what is the cost to pull that copper out? What is the absolute home run benefit of putting fiber in, not only from a speed, resiliency, and things like that, but it's that it's that long time, uh, it's that long term mindset that is so so important when you're looking at business cases. Uh, you know. It's interesting when you think about what we've been able to do here at Verizon, and I think about the way we operate um, a responsible sourcing. You know, we think about everything from human rights to ethical conduct to making sure we protect the environment. That's through our RFP process, that's through our negotiation process, that's through our supplier contracts, you know, and then we take it to the next step. Okay, how do you take that to the next step? And you start to look at the risk because everything we do at Verizon from a supply chain perspective or really from a business perspective looks at the end to end risk of uh, what we're going to be going forward. Risk of supply chain resiliency, risk of product um, obsolescence, risk of customer impact, whether it's consumer or enterprise anywhere around the world, and then risk of those suppliers we're dealing with financial risk, geopolitical risk, all those different things. So you start to put all these things together, whether it's responsible sourcing, putting in your your risk opportunities, and then looking at where do you go? Well, there is no better example um, of what we did at Verizon, uh, and I credit this from our chairman and our Verizon Leadership Council, than the experience during COVID. During COVID, it was a absolute crazy time for our entire globe, and people were making incredibly tough decisions that were impacting employees day in and day out. What I'm most proud of is at Verizon, we stayed on our mission. We stayed on our long-term view of sustainability. We kept focusing on renewable energy and the implementation of renewable energy. We continue to focus on diversifying our supply chain, making our supply chain more resilient. Then we also then had to get flexible. You know, we did things during COVID in our supply chain where we started making hand sanitizer in an old ketchup factory here in the United States. I mean, the flexibility, the the way you think about things, would have never thought about that in any of my career. That was always a commodity I was able to purchase regardless of where I was. But it's that type of thing. And when you're on your journey, whether you're at the beginning, the middle, or you're mature at sustainability, it's making sure you have the end vision and then having the fortitude to stick to it. 
And, and that's, you know, the COVID example I provided is just one, but it really could go across many examples here of Verizon. And uh, there are going to be tough times. There are going to be people who say, I'd rather reallocate that CapEx or OpEx to do something different. But to know where you're going, to know why you're going there, and then to have the executive backing to support you at Verizon, I could not be more proud of where we are right now. So that's very interesting. Um, the other thing, uh, Jim, you mentioned that you are looking at uh, you, you are able to balance all the requirements for risk, and there is a huge amount of, uh, uh, say, validation that you are able to do both from a risk and sustainability perspective. Now that can get um, quite overwhelming and is a humongous task. So, do you have some kind of a platform or systems, and how is that uh, managed? Sure. So the way, the first way we think about everything as it relates to a sustainable supply chain, um, I already told you how we handle responsible sourcing, but then you start to look at how it disseminates through um, the organization. And again, I go back to culture because it starts right at the top. So our board of directors oversees all of our ESG efforts. Um, so everything we do uh, from an, an environmental sustainable governance perspective, that's the highest level there is. Then you start to bring it down and uh, we have a quarterly executive climate oversight committee, which is uh, several of the Verizon leadership um, members, as well as who's really focused on governance and looking across Verizon. Then you keep bringing that down um, even further and you start to say, okay, based on all this happening, how do you go about focusing on what's truly important and how do you make sure you keep things at the top of the mind of shareholders, the external community, and then more importantly, our executives, and then most importantly, the employees. I mentioned earlier, keeping the passion of your employees focused and, and really bringing that passion to life is just so important to your overall success. Even when times get tough and operational budgets may need to be tweaked or pushed out six months or a year based on the, the fiscal simulation that's got, or the fiscal challenges that are, you know, there, there's going to be ebbs and flows. It's keeping that discipline, keeping that thought about it uh, across the board. And then, you know, my last comment there is when we think about our objectives, you know, we've set an overall objective of achieving net zero in our operations by 2035. Um, it's not easy from a real estate perspective, from an energy perspective. Our number one challenge, over 90% of our emissions come from energy. Uh, that's why we are laser focused there. That's where we're laser focused on renewable energy and laser focused on how we can, you know, do it smartly to make sure that we're keeping the business going along, supporting our customers, supporting first responders at what we refer to as the five nines, which is nine, 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 nine availability all the way through putting in renewable energy. So we're focused on the society and the environmental side at the same time. I um, I read about um, one of your posts uh, regarding the um, implementation of a solar initiative. Uh, could you tell us a little more about that? When you think about uh, our footprint, as I mentioned, over 90% of it is focused on um, the carbon and the emissions that come from our electricity, from our networks, both wireless and wired. And you, you start to think about how do you go about that? Well. You mentioned earlier making sure you have financial backing and business cases I talked about, things like that. Well, one of the, the things that, again, I'm incredibly proud, our Treasury Department, our treasurer, um, came up with the idea of another way to fund initiatives like this going forward. So if you go into a traditional business case, a solar business case may have a payback that's longer than a, uh, a non-renewable energy business case. And that makes sense today, may not make sense 10 years from now, but it makes sense today. So how do you fund that? How do you be competitive there? Well, our treasurer and our CFO um, supported the idea of green bonds. And we launched our first green bond. Uh, and the focus there was a $1 billion bond that would be solely and exclusively used for, um, in our case, uh, anything related to ESG or, or green technologies. And we launched that uh, and focused on renewable energy very heavily and green buildings, our very first one. Excellent, excellent uh, uh, response from Wall Street, excellent response from the supplier base, 
and we were able to very clearly document and then audit with a second party opinion our use of proceeds. Well, let me fast forward to where we are. That was 2019, our very first one, February. We are now sitting here in November of 2022, and we've issued four. $1 billion green bonds. And why is that so important? Well, first off, selfishly, that those dollars and cents, we've earmarked them in a very detailed use of proceeds. Again, audited by a third party before we go to market with it. And that's what we're going to deliver on. That's our focus. And we're going to use that. And then more importantly, we're going to continue to audit it every year and tell the investor community, these, this is our billion dollar green bond one, two or three or four, whichever one. And these were where the use of proceeds. We said they were going to go and this is where they're going. Fast forward a little further. And that's where you talk about the renewable energy that we've put on our locations. Very, very um, focused, again, driving the culture, having solar. So when our employees come in, they see it, whether it's a car park, whether it's in um, some land on our properties, wherever the case may be, that starts to build your culture, that reinforces it in your DNA. But then we've also done, because you just don't have enough land on all of your facilities, we've done it off-site too. We've very much focused on uh, partnering what we call near loading, which is close to our facilities, and then partnering and building um, facilities that are focused on solar. We've also done that with turbines too, but your question was on solar. So we've done both of those. And then also working with the local grids because you have to work with the local grids. With the advent, and I'm not going to go there on this question, but with the EVs that are growing every single day, which is a good thing for the environment, it's a huge challenge for the uh, the electric grids. I mean, we do not have enough capacity currently to support the massive amounts of electric vehicles that are coming on the market. We'll get there. I'm not worried about that. But those are those are the type of opportunities and those are where we want to work with the local grids too. So if we're not using that power, push it back up to the grid. You know, uh, I've yeah. talked about it several times. It's really important that we look at this as a as a cross-functional activity. Oh, that's uh, some very interesting insights. And I personally feel that the uh, green bonds uh, is a um, is a very interesting and pioneering initiative and probably also um, one of the say solutions when we because most companies have this challenge of uh, how to fund, you know, green initiatives. Right. So I think uh, the fact that you have successfully done it uh, would be a good um, you know, way forward for and guidance to some of the other organizations who are maybe, uh, say, um, starting off or somewhere in the middle of this journey. So I think that's a, a very good. And do you tie these with metrics as well? I'm assuming uh, that this is what say, <clears throat> X will change to Y. And probably uh, maybe if there are some metrics you could share with us that uh, have been impacted in the journey so far, that will be really interesting. Yeah, well, if you, if you start, metrics is all we do at Verizon. <laughs> um, when you start at the highest level and you look at the allocation, well, those are your simple metrics, where we're going to go, how much we're going to deploy. Um, that's just the broad base. But then you start looking at geographic uh, regions and the impacts there. Um, we tie metrics of renewable energy all the way down to uh, the carbon emissions from a cell site. And we actually have a goal that's in the incentive of every employee at Verizon, and it's called our carbon intensity goal. And that is, in the simplest terms, the amount of terabyte traffic or petabyte now we're coming up on through our networks versus the energy it costs to, uh, or energy it takes to run those networks. And it's the, it's the benefit there, and that's tied right to our incentive. Why is that so important? Because then you start thinking about, okay, I'm sitting in network new product development, and I start looking at, okay, what is the 5G radio or the 6G radio? You know, what is the energy com consumption required on that radio? If you think about a 4G radio, driving up and down highways and things, very large radios, large spray. When you think about a 5G radio, much smaller, much more dense, but tremendous, tremendous speed uh, upgrades. Well, now you start thinking about, okay, for that 4G radio, it took me this much energy to run. For the 5G radio, it's actually less. And the material for the project is actually less. But 
If you're in certain areas, you may need more radios. So have you actually helped it? So thinking through all the concenter, all the opportunities of the ecosystem of how we run our networks is super, super important. And that goes right back to the question of technologists, new product development, having to think about things end to end and all of the impacts that come with it. And then the last thing I'll say about that, then it's so important of our upstream OEMs, our partners. How do we go about working with our partners to make sure that as they start building their next revolution, their next evolution of radios, um, that they're making sure they're dematerializing, they're taking and uh, making sure the products they build are built the right way, but then they're also looking at the energy cons consumption. And that's not only the physical energy consumption of processors or repeaters or whatever the case may be, but it's also the software solution. The ability to turn off, in this case, radios, when they're not being used in the middle of the night, where you don't need as much power to them. And then to triangulate to other uh, radios and then wake them up at a certain time. All of those things are benefits back to the grid, back to the ecosystem. And that's kind of how you think about it end to end. But as far as metric goes, we could be talking about metrics here at Verizon for a long time. We also, we also focus on our supplier diversity or diverse suppliers um, and making sure that a certain percentage of our spend is spent with diverse uh, suppliers, whether they be uh, people of color, um, small, medium, uh, you know, type suppliers, and making sure that we're rounding our, our portfolio uh, so that we're not just, it's easy for a big company like Verizon to go to other big companies, but that's not who our customer base is, that's not what a responsible business does, and by tying that also to compensation, just like we do with our sustainability metrics of carbon intensity, you're, you're again, I'm going to go back to it again, it's culture, it's environment, it's building it into the DNA of who we are. Talking of suppliers, now in this journey, suppliers and other stakeholders are extremely uh, important and valuable partners. How was the journey with uh, suppliers? Because suppliers also are typically looking for like um, a you know, shortcut to the business, right? So whatever, if a lower price would get them the business, then uh, that's what they would push for saying, uh, because that's how they perceive the buyer as well or the their stakeholder so how was the journey with suppliers and um, uh, what would, what uh, was done in verizon to bring the suppliers and the other stakeholders on board yeah you know being a supply chain person you just can't live without suppliers uh, they're they're 100 percent part of and required part of our ecosystem um but but you hit it uh, the nail right on the head there when you look about a, a, a large supplier base, I won't say the number, but a large supplier base uh, supporting us in the over 130 countries we work in, you have your largest suppliers and you have your, your small suppliers. You know, they are both just as important. So then you start thinking about, okay, how do we work with those suppliers? The larger suppliers, a little bit easier at times because uh, for the most part, they're publicly traded companies. They have boards of directors. Uh, they uh, have to hear their stakeholder feedback. Um, but also a little bit challenging at the same time because unless they're uh, a consumer-facing company, they may be behind the scenes and they may not be getting that direct feedback from their customers that, hey, you need to do things more responsibly, whether it be your packaging, your energy efficiency, the, the dematerialization, team materialization of your products, you know, you have to think about all those things. And if they're not a consumer facing, um, they, they may not have that front and center. All the way down to the smaller suppliers who really run the challenge financially of doing things above and beyond their just making margin. So the way we look at it is um, we started this in 2013, very small, and we've rolled it out since. We've assessed over our approximately 530 some odd suppliers when you think about the 80 20 that's over 80 percent of the spend on an annual basis we use a third-party tool we have them go in there and we start as simple as do you have a sustainability program do you have a do you track your GHG do you uh, hold yourself to metrics where do you um, where do you do your manufacturing 
who are your key components. So we have a whole process where we start to evaluate them. And it's, it's not your traditional evaluation to say, okay, they fail, they're gone. But more importantly, it's about, okay, we've identified these areas that we find important to us, you're not doing them, how do we create corrective actions and get you to where you need to be? Uh, it, and that goes across everything. That goes from human rights to material, to recycling, to environmental sustainability. It's the whole, again, whole end-to-end -end spectrum of everything we do. And we do create supplier report cards and we hold quarterly business reviews and we go over them. And being a responsible um, supplier means having, uh, as best they can, a transparent, sustainable supply chain. And if they don't, we work with them to push them in that direction. It is also part of our RFP criteria. We ask those questions before a supplier even comes on board. Uh, so it's it's not an easy, it's not a black and white, uh, but it's a process we put in place and it's a muscle we're continuing to build. That's, um, that's good to know that <laughs> how you were able to build, to bring these suppliers on board. And uh, so from a journey perspective, um, uh, you know, how would you advise companies who are say a little behind on the overall journey who are probably just now starting off? What would be your suggestions uh, to them that uh, from learnings that you had that these are things uh, they could do better or they could do in a much faster way? Yeah, so this goes about this goes against every bone in my being because I am the most competitive guy. I'm a sports guy. I'm, I'm really about uh, how do you compete. Um, but when you think about sustainability and you think about the entire ecosystem, it's actually not a competitive sport. Um, I've had the opportunity to sit down with many of the largest competitors to Verizon around the world and have conversations that I never would have thought I would have had of in my 27 years here. So. Um, start there. Start to realize that it is not a competitive sport. S start there by realizing collaboration throughout your supply chain, throughout your ecosystem is, is where you really need to get your head first. Then jump right into what is our impact. Start to measure yourself. See what you do really well. See where there's opportunities and see what your baseline is. Because, you know, what gets measured gets... Uh, gets fixed across the board there. And until you know where you're going for, I, I do not encourage people to jump right into something because it's the flavor of the day. Uh, I, I encourage people to take the long, the long term approach. Make sure you're seeing where you are now and then set incremental goals. If you set out to do a billion dollar green bond day one, I'm telling you now you're going to fail because it took us a long time to get there. And then we matured to get there. And now we're successful at doing it. Um, and then the only other thing I would say is, is make sure if you're on the beginning of this journey, find your internal advocates, find the people who have that passion, because they're the ones who are going to, you're going to run into obstacles. They're the ones every time you run into it, they're going to work hard to find a way to get to a, a place you're better than today. And that's the key. It's not about zero to a hundred. It's better than you were the day before. And it's continuing that momentum forward. Um, that's why I say at Verizon, I can't be more proud of the journey we've been on, but it, it's, it's getting those internal advocates. It's going on your journey. And then when you run into hiccups and you run into challenges, it's having the fortitude to slow maybe a little bit, but keep your eye on the goal there at the end of the day. Uh, and then lastly, uh, it goes with sports as well. Sometimes you just need to be, uh, lucky. <laughs> Sometimes it's better to be lucky than good, they say. Yeah, no, I think uh, you mentioned a very important point. I think there is, especially around sustainability and the uh, on this whole circular supply chain, um, you know, and setting up some of those and uh, uh, cooperation with um, uh, the other players in the industry is going to become more and more important towards driving uh, at least sustainability if not the other things that are generally talked about. So I think, and uh, it's good to know that you've already made that beginning in the uh, uh, in the telecom sector. So I think that's great. And probably some of the other sectors uh, could take some learnings uh, from that as well. And uh, so how has that, uh, this whole journey, and uh, uh, like you said very rightly, and I can see the passion 
in you as well, right? So you said we have to find the passionate people uh, in the organization who can, uh, you know, drive these kind of initiatives uh, and programs. Um, so uh, how has this changed? Has this changed you individually over the years? And has it impacted you as a person? And uh, has it impacted anything in your personal life with your family and so on? Uh, would you like to share anything on that? Uh, sure. I uh, <laughs> the first question, first comment is what has it impacted? I mean, uh, that conversation uh, November of two thousand and nine has changed my entire entire career from a professional perspective, but. Uh, I am a Jersey Shore native. I grew up a clam digger down at the beach. I was a lifeguard for many years. Um, when I think about all the things we do uh, day in, day out here to make Verizon better, and I see the incredible passion of people around the world in all the different organizations uh, that are many nonprofit um, or, you know, even the partners we have at places like the Arbor Day Foundation and the great work they do at Trees uh, or, or whatever the case may be. It, it's really changed um, my view of things. So my supply chain job, I'm a glass half empty. I worry about everything. If I see a storm, if I see a, 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 a tropical depression or a hurricane or something, I think about, okay, what's the impact on our network? Do we have enough supplies in the right area? How do we get there? How do we we call it running to a crisis when we leave we, we live by a credo here and we are all about our networks being up and running for our customers so i'm a glass half empty worried when i look at sustainability i'm i'm absolutely the opposite i'm a glass half full i see that there are opportunities out there for us to change the direction um, from a climate perspective and that really excites me and to knowing knowing the company that I work for has their passion behind it at an executive level and is putting where their money where their mouth is. We can't solve everything, but what we can do is lead by example. We can continue to push forward. We can collaborate. Um, you know, that that's super, super important to me. And, and you know, get you out of bed every morning. And then lastly, you know, I mentioned I have, I have five kids and, and they grew up in a different generation than I did. I'll never have to explain to them sustainability. Um, they just get it whether it's recycling or whether it's energy, they just get it. And it gives me a lot of optimism for the next generations. Um, so uh, uh, that that's what it's done to me. So maybe it's going to make me younger at some point. How about that? <laughs> you already look very young and that passion is, uh, you know, we can see the glow of that passion on your face yeah. itself. And I think uh, one of the reasons which is driving that passion is also uh, you know, the fact that uh, we all want to leave a better world for our children. And uh, so I think that also drives, is one of the drivers for passion. So uh, for being passionate about this topic. So uh, that's been a very um, uh, informative, uh, I would say, uh, you know, discussion with you, Jim, uh, and to so enlightening and as well as so exciting and uh, motivating for me to see the passion and how you have been able to bring about uh, such a big difference, uh, not only, and you have been a community person otherwise. So uh, you are a good man. And that's why, <laughs> you know, good things happen to you and to people and the organization around you. So that's great to know uh, about you as well, Jim, and well, the journey at Verizon. I, I appreciate your comments and it's very kind. It's not about me, it's about Verizon and, and I am, you won't find anyone more proud uh, to be a V team or, or proud of who we are. Uh, and we count on partners like Infosys to come along on our journey. And, and, you know, I say that with a smile, but, uh, very, very knowledge, uh, very knowledgeable about what Infosys is doing. And it's, and it's very impressive there too. So thank you for your partnership. And, uh, as, as we say, you know, at Verizon, what's next? How do we move this thing forward? Because times are exciting and, and we can't wait to do what's next. Thank you very much, Jim, for sharing your thoughts and the experiences. And hopefully it will be um, a good learning experience uh, and interesting experience for our uh, viewers as well, uh, for the uh, procurement and supply chain community.